we're going to talk a little bit, although well, I think we may have difficulty finding something to disagree on. Um, let me ask Joe about the politics. Uh, I mean, you, I was uh, the chief investigator of the Senate Banking Committee back in the 70s. That's the only government job I've ever had. Joe, you were there. You, you were uh, very senior in the Clinton administration. You wrote a book about it. Um, why do you think we have such a hard time uh, winning the politics? Uh, I mean, we've had a real-time experiment that shows that austerity doesn't work. Uh, you make the case quite eloquently that uh, debt relief would have a tonic macroeconomic impact, and yet I'm sure there are people in this room who are convinced the United States is a little beyond its means and in order to get the economy back on track, the best thing to do would be to cut Social Security because we're stealing money from our children. And this has just become a mantra that has taken root. Uh, and yet, it isn't just a case of, of people misunderstanding the economics. It's a case of financiers spending billions of dollars to make sure that the economics are not well understood. So. <laughs> Why Why do we have such difficulty winning back the politics? Well, I, I, I think there are, there are a couple ways of thinking about this. I mean, first, I do think that uh, many people, in even in the 1%, uh, uh, actually don't understand the economics. I mean, it, it is uh, astounding to me how many people who claim to be experts in managing risk didn't understand even the concepts of risk. And, and that should be pretty clear that they didn't understand what they were doing. Uh, and so I think the real, our real, and, and there's a famous uh, uh, statement, I can't remember from whom, that people have a hard time understanding something that's not in their own interest to understand. <laughs> okay, so, okay. So, so the point is that, that I think a lot of these people don't want to understand what is going on. Um, <coughs> So there, there, there are interests, there are ideologies. These are very deep-seated uh, ideologies. Some very simple economics, uh, you know, Merkel keeps saying, households can't live beyond their means, how can governments? And people keep trying to explain to her, households are not the same as countries. When, when governments cut back, Incomes go down, jobs get destroyed, and the, 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 the analogy is a bad analogy. And, you know, she was a physicist. Uh, I mean, I can't believe she can't understand uh, that, that, but uh, she just goes back to the same story. Let me just give one more example in Europe where you see the role that they don't want to see it is, um, they keep talking, Germany keeps talking about Greece, and they spend too much. And then I always, after that, say, well, but Spain had a surplus before the crisis and a low debt GDP ratio. And after I say that, they go back to talking about Greece. And I say, well, I want to talk about Spain. And I said, Greece were the only problem. You know, Greece is 10 million people. You know, Europe could manage that. Uh, it's, it's Spain, Italy, it's, it's, it's one country after another, and they go back to talking about Greece. So I get out of this a feeling that, that they just don't want to hear the other story. You know, I, I think um, there, there's a mix of innocent misunderstanding and, and willful deception. And um, one really interesting thing is the confusion about preventing so-called moral hazard where you don't want to invite people to undertake excessive risks before the fact, and then what you do after the fact, uh, ex ante and ex post, if you will. So before the fact, it's a good idea to discourage people from undertaking excessive risks. In this case, the people who undertook excessive risks were the bankers, but leave that aside for the moment. After the fact, when you have a collapse, um, it becomes a macroeconomic problem. People don't have the purchasing power to get the economy back on track. And yet, <clears throat> relief from excessive debt is treated as something that would reward improvident behavior. Well, the time to, the 
time you worry about that is before the fact. After the catastrophe happens, you, you need to get the economy back on track. And it seems to me that there is a kind of um, rendezvous of the self-interest of Wall Street, on the one hand, not to be regulated, and to make sure that creditors always collect debts, no matter how dire the consequences to debtors and to the rest of the economy. Um, and that feeds into a kind of innocent tendency on the part of ordinary people to analogize the economy as a whole to the household. Um, Mrs. Merkel should know better than this, but I think a lot of people will say, well, uh, I can't live beyond my means. How can the country live beyond its means? And there really is a misunderstanding of the ability of the public sector to incur debt to restore the productive capacity of the economy, which is very, very different from the constraints on the house. Yeah. Can I, let me just, one of the reasons, if you're really worried about this issue, and I think there's some, some reasons to worry about it, what you do is you set up great rules and regulations. And that's where, that's where regulatory reform. So, so <coughs> you have rules and regulations about debt to income, loan to value ratios. <coughs> Most home owners do not want to be in the position they're in now. You know, underwater, enormous amount of suffering. They're not going to happen to do that again. And if you had a good banking system, you would have enforced these kinds of restrictions, and it would not have happened. The interesting thing, it's the banks who repeatedly get this, uh, get into this position. They've been bailed out. You know, all these bailouts, the, the Latin American, correctly called the Latin American bailout, the uh, Mexican bailout, the uh, Korean, Thailand, Indonesia, Argentina. These were all bailouts of banks. They weren't bailouts of countries. The countries had to repay. It was the banks that got bailed out. Well, yeah. and if you, if you look at Greece, or Spain, or Portugal, or Ireland, I think a lot of people don't appreciate the nature of the relief that Mrs. Merkel or the ECB gives Greece. I mean, the way it works is, um, it just happened again. So Greece was made to lay off 15,000 civil servants. And then in exchange, uh, the so-called Troika, uh, the ECB, the European Commission, and um, the IMF doles out another $2 billion of, uh, euros of aid. Where does the 2 billion euros of aid go? It doesn't go to rebuild the Greek economy. It goes to service debt. It goes to keep current on interest payments. So the, the debtor's prison metaphor is exact. They're kept in a prison where the real economy is depressed, and they're spoon-fed just enough money to repay interest to their creditors at a price of having to shackle the real economy. And that is just a disgrace. And you wonder at what point Greece and Spain and Portugal and uh, Ireland would maybe rise up and say, the hell with this. We would rather default. We would rather uh, leave the euro. Anything would not be as bad as the, the, the prison that we're being put in. What, Joe, what, what do you think of the possibility of, uh, of these countries either leaving the eurozone uh, and, and, and defaulting on these debts and having a cheaper currency going back to the drop on the peseta, or threatening to do so as a way of getting the attention of oh. their miners? Uh, clearly, they, they, they should be threatening, and it's a, it's a credible threat from the following point. As I said before, under the current institutional arrangements, there is absolutely no way out of their depression. So Europe has only one of two ways of going. Either the, the break up that, uh, uh, you know, the, the, that I think will follow enormous suffering that they will be put through before the breakup, or Europe will have to have a banking union, a, a single banking uh, system with a common deposit uh, insurance, um, a, fisc a more of a fiscal union so that the borrowing is done at the level of the Eurozone rather than the individual countries. Um, so there, there are a whole set of reforms that will have to occur. But those reforms are going to be very difficult given what Germany keeps saying, we're not a transfer union. 
And what's really interesting <coughs> about, about that is if they brought down the interest rates that they had to pay by mutualizing the debt, right. the likelihood that there would be any significant transfer is very low. Right. So the cost to Germany of continuing its current course is actually larger. And you sort of wonder, how did they get themselves into this bind of this way of thinking <laughs> where as the creditor, they're actually putting themselves more at risk than if they did uh, a debt for, uh, a forgiveness. Well, I think it's partly the fact that uh, this is a good deal for Germany in the following sense, that when the euro was created, a lot of skeptics said, this is not an optimal currency zone. Uh, the same currency cannot possibly be right for Germany and Greece, and so the the value of the euro is midway between what is right for Greece and what is right for Germany, which means that Germany, as an export power, has an undervalued currency. The economist at the University of Munich has calculated that if the Deutschmark still existed, it would be about 40% more expensive than the euro. So Europe, Germany, as an export power, gets to trade with an artificially cheap currency. And the other, the other way that Germany gains is that um, because so much of uh, Europe is in a panic about where you can keep your money safe, all of this capital flees to Germany, which means Germany has an artificially low uh, rate of interest. So, and can, can I just come yeah, on that? I think what you're saying is we don't need to convince them, we need to demolish them. <laughs> um, I also agree with virtually everything you've said. Um, I, but I just spent the week in Cheyenne, Wyoming on business. Take the mic. Um, and I will tell you that, yes, there is... Geez, geez, I'll just keep talking. Two-thirds of the one percent uh, that doesn't agree with you and that exerts influence on the other side. There is also... 50 percent of the people in this country are uneducated, and I have just spent time with a bunch of workers trying to buy a ball of bearing factory. And at the end of the day, after numerous conversations, and I'm talking about two weeks of hundreds of conversations with people who had high school educations and grew up in Cheyenne, Wyoming, what you presented today in the way that you presented it would be inexplicable to them. So if you want to know how we do better in politics, we have to explain it more simply. We have a whole other rap for Cheyenne. <laughs> Well, I hope so. It didn't work for me. Um, and by the way, we're insourcing 30 jobs back from Europe. So I'm, but that's not the point. The point is, you know, we're blaming it all on the two-thirds of the 1% that choose not to believe it. That's two-thirds of 1%. There's a bunch of people out there that when I explain to them that public debt is better, and that it is better for someone to be hurt in bankruptcy by not getting their money back than it is for someone to be burdened by bankruptcy, and that the hospital has to pass the expenses on for it. They look at me as if I was speaking Greek. It's not that they don't want to believe me, they just don't get it, because we all deliver this message in a way that's too complicated. How do we fix that? Well, let me just mention one aspect of that, which is, uh, I think one, one, one of the things that uh, we haven't really talked about is the success that many people, on, I think, on the right, on that side, have had in selling their ideas. You know, it's a simple message. That, that, that uh, one of the ways of thinking about this, and I, I, I talk about this in my book, Price of Inequality, is that if you can sell toxic products like cigarettes, you can sell toxic ideas. And they've succeeded, that we, we have the technology, we have the knowledge, they have the means, you know, the, the, the resources to, and the incentives to do that. So that is a, that is a part of the problem. And, and I think one of the things that institutions like Dickinson and the Roosevelt Institute are, are involved in are, are trying to figure out how to communicate an alternative vision of, uh, an, an alternative views of, of, of these issues. I found the single most powerful line of argument is to remind people about World War II. 
which was a, a good war. It's a, it's a touchstone in the, in the national memory. What did we do during World War II? We borrowed $100 million in six months, and the unemployment rate melted from 12% to zero, and uh, all the training was on the job, and people who were assumed to be not capable of working uh, took jobs on more production plants, and the real economy grew at the rate of 12% a year for four straight years, even though we built most of the stuff to be blown up. <laughs> now, imagine if we had spent that kind of money building stuff that would make the economy more productive. That's an argument that regular people can get, and, um, but you're right. We, I mean, this is, a, this is a New York audience, it's NYU, so we're throwing around words like uh, pro-cyclicality. But I, I, I think a good politician um, is capable of explaining this in terms that I think regular people can follow. Uh, sir, in the back. Hi, um, my name is Matthew Rolnick. I'm an adjunct faculty at City College. And uh, one of the challenges that I have was actually asked by um, the gentleman up front about how we communicate this more clearly. But the other question I had was, um, if you look at some of the work of uh, Bernard Litter, maybe, in terms of alternative currency, does that offer some sort of other alternative that it really does do this. Um, <laughs> does that offer some sort of alternative towards, um, as another way out of approaching the debt problems that we can't seem to get taken care of politically and legislatively? Is there an opportunity for, for local currencies and complementary currencies and commodity currencies that could help alleviate some of the problem that we're experiencing? Uh, I, I'm not very optimistic about these, <laughs> these, these other uh, currency approaches. I, I, I think that uh, for Europe, uh, getting out of the euro, you know, I, I think my view is that unless they make the reforms I described, if they want to save Europe, they'll have to give up the euro. So that, there they're going to have to have uh, alternative currencies. And you know, the general consensus, growing consensus, I think, among economists, the simplest way for Europe to solve the problems is to have Germany leave. And that would uh, lead to the least adjustments for the rest of Europe. Um, and it would correct uh, the, the I, I hate, I'm now feeling so conscious about these you know, trade imbalances, <laughs> current account uh, deficit. But you know, we've been criticizing. China for having a uh, trade surplus that is an unfair trade, you know, we, we lambasting them. Germany is worse than China, um, much worse. And yet it hasn't figured into our, our political rhetoric. And of course, a lot of people say, well, Germany did it the fair way, and China does it the unfair way. And the German's fair way is to kill the rest of Europe. Uh, yeah. yeah, China at least has the wit to lend us money so we can buy their products. Germany wants to be an export powerhouse even larger than China relative to its GDP and crush its customers. This is not smart. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm not, a, I'm not a professional economist, but having traveled in Greece uh, many years ago, and Greece was a very poor country, the reason for the prosperity of Greece when you, when you use the word depression, depression is relative to a previous level. And the previous level in Greece was inflated by purchases of villas by Germans and other people like that. Also, uh, also in Spain, I think what fueled both those economies was the resort economy, which came from the Germans. And with the Germans sacrificed also by having a weak, uh, weaker currency, as they also had to pay for their oil with weaker currency. So there's kind of a balance there. You can't measure a depression from a, an economic peak, which is fueled by a real estate bill. Oh, I, yes and no. You, 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 your point is right that, that some of what happened in Greece, particularly in Spain, was fueled by a real estate bubble. On the other hand, when your unemployment rate is 30% and people can't put bread on the table, that's a depression. So when you traveled in Greece, there wasn't 30% unemployment. People may have had a more modest standard of living. But they had jobs. Well, they, they didn't have jobs. They were just they were hanging out in the street. Oh, sure. Yeah, Greece, really Greece was a poorer country. <coughs> I mean, I also traveled in Greece, and you didn't have anything like the, the level of unemployment. So it, 
it, it's a fair point that the euro and the naivete of investors who assume that because there was a common currency, the interest rates on Greek or Spanish investment should be roughly the same as, as, as German. But again, the question is this ex ante, ex post question, before the fact, mistakes were made. You know, a lot of blame to go around. After the fact, it just doesn't make sense to destroy these countries because of somebody's idea of setting an example or, or somebody's idea of, of fiscal probity. And we could have done that with Germany after World War II. We certainly had every reason to do it with Germany after World War II. Britain got less of a break after World War II than the Germans did. And Britain won the war, but we gave them 93% debt relief. So, you know. Two more, two more points. Uh, 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 one of them is the, the flaws in the euro in many ways were evident before the crisis. Uh, because the euro resulted, or it was associated with this excessive inflow of capital, combined with this ideology that you didn't want to put any constraints. You know, some of us, I had told uh, 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 a number of the governments, uh, look, at you, you need to put constraints on the capital inflows and do something about the bubble. They said, Mar let the markets take care of it. The market will take care of it, and eventually did, but at a great cost. So the euro provided a framework in which there was this enormous flow of money in that eventually uh, led to the bubble. The euro is causing the problem today because the adjustment mechanism that would have helped restore full employment isn't there. They can't adjust uh, uh, their exchange rate. So in a sense, whatever you think about what these countries did, right or wrong, the euro is part of the problem, clearly. Sir, you've been trying to ask questions. Yes. What, uh, my name is Martin Road. And um, what I find very difficult to understand, what I find very difficult to understand and quite despairing is when Bernanke gives billions and billions of dollars each year to buy off toxic assets from banks who are pocketing a lot of money and getting big bonuses and not having anybody on the political scene really take, the, take them to cash from either party. And I think that, that that's something that doesn't require a lot of sophistication to understand, that the banks are, are, are profiting, and it's the, 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 the poor people are getting poorer, and nobody's picking it up. Well, I have very mixed feelings about Chairman Bernanke. On the one hand, uh, if, if this had been Alan Greenspan, <laughs> the Fed would be saying, in order for us to lower interest rates, you in the executive and legislative branch, we want you to pursue austerity. Bernanke's saying the opposite. Bernanke's saying, hey, we're the only game in town. And even if you're too foolish to uh, use the government's power uh, to invest money publicly, we're at least going to run an accommodative monetary policy. We're going to have plenty with low interest rates. That's good. The bad thing is he's doing it through the banks, and the banks are sitting on the money, and uh, they're just getting richer and richer. Bill Greider, our friend uh, who covers this stuff for the nation, has written some very interesting articles saying, can Bernanke find ways of injecting all of this liquidity, this money, directly into the economy, the way the Reconstruction Finance Corporation did in the 30s? Uh, maybe the Fed should refinance mortgages directly. Uh, maybe the Fed should bypass these banks who are part of the problem. So I don't fault Bernanke for having a loose monetary policy. It's about the only thing that's keeping us out of a depression. I do fault the Fed for just thinking the only way you can channel the money is through the banks. And Joe knows a lot more about this than I do. I'm very curious to know what you think about that. Well, no, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, uh, let me just make a couple of comments. One of them is, uh, one of the, uh, consistent with your perspective, one of the strange things is that, that uh, the <coughs> Fed lends money to the banks at essentially zero. They take the money and uh, lend, it, lend it to other people, including back to the government, at 3%. And then 
they discovered that they made a lot of money. You take a trillion dollars and you get it, borrow it at a zero, and you lend it back to the government at three percent, you make thirty billion dollars, and you can feel good about yourself. And you pay yourself a bonus. And you pay yourself a bonus, as one of my friends put, this twelve year old kid could do that. Uh, and you don't have to be a genius to make money if you can get it at zero interest rate. Now, that's where uh, what Bob was saying makes a lot of sense, and actually a lot of other, even conservative economists have been pointing this out. Rather than lending to the bank, if they did things more directly, uh, it would have a more stimulative effect on the economy. The ideology, though, is, and it's a very strange one in the aftermath, is the government isn't good at lending to private sector is. <laughs> As me, I find that a little bit um, uh, strange, but this view is very widely, very widely held. But the uh, institution that was described, where, which was bought up mortgages and refinanced them in the Great Depression. What? Yeah, there, there was a, Senator uh, Merkel, 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 yeah, Merkel yeah. Yeah, from, from Oregon, was really pushing this idea uh, and was trying to get the administration to do something administratively along these lines. And unfortunately, nothing has come of it. And I think if the Fed were more behind it, uh, it, it, it might have been, it might have been able to come uh, about. So, so the problem is, Ideally, it would be done with legislation. But it's, it's difficult to get legislation through, but I think they could do it probably through administrative means. If I may, is buying toxic assets similar to lend, lending money to banks at zero interest? I mean, they're both beneficial to the bank. But if buying toxic assets is, is, is more giving them money than lending them even at, at zero interest. It, it's, a, it, it's taking bad assets off their books. And, but it's actually more complicated than that because one of the things that they've done is by lowering interest rates, allowing them to refinance, they, what they do is they take risky mortgages off the bank's book balance sheet and put it onto the uh, federal government's balance sheet. So that's a lot of the things that have been going on surreptitiously and then the banks say, look, at things are working much better. Um, and the government is not doing so well. It's, it's, it's actually more complicated and, and, and in many ways worse than you described. Let's take one more question. Over there. I wanted to see if uh, each of you could talk about the opportunities and limitations of private debt forgiveness, uh, kind of like the rolling jubilee that strike debt is doing from Occupy Wall Street as a means to not only bypass the government, but then put pressure on the government to forgive debts. I think it's a very, it's a very good thing. It, it, for exactly the reasons that, that you suggest. Uh, it, it demonstrates the value of debt forgiveness. It, it shames the government uh, by, by showing that regular people can uh, pursue debt forgiveness. The problem, of course, is scale. And um, if, if somehow the example of that could leverage the government uh, into pursuing a policy of, of debt forgiveness, that would be a lot more effective than doing it uh, a little bit at a time, but, but every, every, uh, every bit helps. Can I say one other thing about that, which is uh, um, recall that, that in the year 2000 there was a very big movement called the Jubilee Movement to get debt forgiveness for poor countries, the, for the most uh, indebted poor countries. Mm -hmm. uh, and it actually succeeded uh, in, in that movement, in the Global Civil Society Movement did succeed in getting uh, large uh, debt forgiveness, including, I mean, the irony uh, 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 of all this was was uh, the one country that the Bush administration was interested in getting debt forgiveness for was Iraq. <laughs> of course. The, the other irony is that the IMF finally came around on the subject of debt forgiveness for very poor, highly indebted countries. And so they discarded the playbook that says you have to squeeze these countries to repay. And it's as if the European Union has picked up the IMS playbook that was discredited 10 years ago and is applying it to Europe's poorest countries. So um, 
I hate to end on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just going to uh, amplify what you said about the old uh, IMF attitude. In the Argentine crisis, uh, the attitude of, of the IMF was characterized uh, by, we can't accept yes for an answer. Uh, they, they, would, they would put demands in Argentina uh, that were very high and say, you have to do this. Uh, and uh, Argentina would reluctantly say yes. And they'd say, oh, well, obviously we didn't ask for enough. And then they would uh, demand more from Argentina. And then uh, finally Argentina said, uh, I'm sorry, we're not playing your game. And what they showed was they restructured their debt on their own. This may be a optimistic note. They restructured their debt, and without the sanction of the IMF, and there followed a series of years until the global financial crisis, in which Argentina was one of the fastest growing countries in the world. Uh, and it, it really showed that there was life after debt. <laughs> and that uh, if you restructure debt, it can really make a very big difference. I, I was an optimistic note. Thank you. Before we close, uh, Miles, the uh, last question, and that is that I do sense, and I can't credit your book yet, Bob, because it only just came out last week, that there is a certain level of change in the nature of the debate compared to a year ago, uh, even from Obama, but from many other places, that maybe this austerity stuff isn't something that we ought to buy and hold. Uh, do you sense that there's a, any kind of a change in the wind in the character of the debate domestically? And I think Europe has obviously helped as a, as a, negative, a great teacher by negative example. I think there is a lot of cognitive dissonance. I mean, here Jack Lou, the new Treasury Secretary, goes to Europe and he says, you guys shouldn't be so uh, intent on this austerity kick. He's the guy who persuaded Obama to embrace austerity. So it's like, you know, do, do as we say, not as we do. But I do think, and I do think it has everything to do with my book. <laughs> that the debate is changed because the facts on the ground are just irrefutable. Austerity doesn't work. And so the question is, how much more irrationality in the face of irrefutable facts are we going to have to, uh, to suffer? So I knew I could count on you for something. <laughs>